Howdy. Welcome to No Excuses, Just Reasons with Reed Mueller. I'm a 28-year-old man that just learned that vegetables actually do give you energy. I spent a lot of my life just going deep into the will of hatred and other things, and I could have just had a carrot. How sweet's that? 50 years to go. Not bad. You figure stuff out as you go. There's no way I live 50 more years, but you might. That's pretty sweet. Eat some carrots, dude. Hate people less. 54% of the nation, adult nation, can't read at a 6th grade level. Those are pre-COVID numbers. We're going downhill. Eat a carrot. Roast it at a nice 425 for 20 minutes or so. Add some rice, maybe an egg or something. And you're going to have some energy. Some nice, not anger, produced energy. That being said, reading things right now is kind of a fucking nightmare. I have chronic migraine issues, and I read that they finally did a study, CTE, I think. Nope, that's football shit. Well, they finally did a study that proved... CAT scan? Brain scan? They did a brain scan of some sort that proved people with migraines brain actually swells up. And that can't be good. I'm not loving it. I'm gonna try to pretend that it makes me smarter and better at things, but it's probably a mini stroke. But I am a man of irrational confidence, and when I'm at my best, I just accept that and move forward with way too much confidence. Can you hear how good this carrot fucking, like, impacted my night? I feel like I could break a wall right now in a positive way, not a domestic situation way. In a way that one of my many senseis, Raymond Saint, would be proud of. It's great to be you. And following the veggie diet way, now my anger can slowly store up inside of me until I need to release it, as it was designed. Reason number two that reading is not that great right now. Reason number two is every, and I mean every, Freshwater fish in this country is basically poisoned. Everyone. I like bluegill. I like perch. They're gone. As my favorite character from South Park pronounces it, it's gone. Harrison Yates, baby. Good cap. Every single freshwater fish, you eat one, and it's equivalent to drinking a month of the tainted Forever Chemicals water. That just can't be good. Next, they're going to tell us the deer live positive gay lives or something. It's just... Obviously, Lucifer has come back, right? Nothing we did. Our lifestyle is totally, totally doable. But we're following the J.R. Smith Irrational Confidence Way, and we're just going to drive the bus into the wall, and I can kind of respect that. They're calling for a mustard shortage this next harvest season, when, whenever that is, I think during the summer. Any fucking way. I, I'm 28. I just learned how good carrots were. I've been an adult for 10 years. Mustard is better than alcohol. I'm choosing the nice Dijon mustard over the Corbel brandy. If we have to choose. And we're going to pretty soon. I'm hiding mustard bottles around the house like Carlton Lassiter does guns from Psych. If I need shower mustard, I have shower mustard. No, Sarah, the Golden River was not referring to my piss. I'm gonna pour some mustard on you. And then enjoy it. But, yeah, the mustard's going away for at least a little bit. Science is saying perhaps longer. Because it got too hot and there's droughts and stuff. It's all bullshit, for sure. Bullshit until I don't have my mustard no more. And it is kind of funny that we have 28 years left before the oceans come and take, like, a good portion of the shoreline away from us. Which is why the dolphins are pushing Tiwa into that huddle so quickly, by the way. They have 28 years left to win one for Miami. Godspeed. If we're destroying the planet in that timeline, Tua can have that little ringing in his ear. Long term. We're gonna send Miami out right with three Super Bowl championships. That's one per the next three decades until Miami's not a thing anymore. That's pretty fucking realistic and according to the Aaron Rodgers laws, you fucking should win a Super Bowl 
every three months. They have like 150 plus months. I don't do math anymore. I am high on an edible. How you fucking doing? I am recording this from a closet that I kind of spuffed up to be a little bit of a studio, but mostly because that's how embarrassing comedy is now. The gays get to live openly, which they always should have, but now comedy in the closet. And that's uh, like human rights fair trade or whatever, but God, pretty cramped in here. Speaking on uh, shame and closets and whatnot, one of my top overall people I looked up to, senseis, was essentially George Costanza and or Larry David. Well, it did make me kind of funny and uh, a jerk, and I have pooped in public before, which we could talk about, I guess. But I wanted to say, now, now that I've reached, you know, full-on adulthood, the episodes that Costanza is really going off the rails are starting to relate to me more and more. I'll just be watching my sensei do his thing on film, and he'll say something like, I've never said I love you to anyone before. And then I realize, me neither. Oh, am I wrecking havoc at work as I should be, but... I've not told anyone I love them. There's an episode where he quits his job because his boss wouldn't let him use the his own, like, manager's bathroom. So George storms out, quits his job, he's sitting in the apartment with Jerry, and they're going over what other careers he could, like kind of shake around with and George is listing like sports announcer Jerry gives him the yeah they usually give that job to ex-ball players and people in broadcasting George yaga. upset George and I'm just sitting at home like I can't I open up my own Chinese restaurant figure it out on the fly why can't I do that George and I deserve to say I love you to someone even if we don't actually feel it for fuck's sake. So yeah, what I'm basically trying to say is following George Costanza's lead makes you a funny kid, but George Costanza is an adult. The worst version. I'm trying to do a fucking podcast right now. That's so gross compared to, well, eating out of the trash. It's still kind of worse than just eating out of the trash. God, the 90s were beautiful. You just got to live. He was so confident he was going to get away with that and no one would ever film it and put it out or whatever. He went for it. One person caught him. Out of the whole fucking world, one person saw him eat this out of the trash. He could have just gone full denial. Which he did, now that I think of it. So I must ask myself, what would George do near the end of the world? We're not at it yet, but we're, we're nearing it. I think he'd eat the fish. I think my sensei would eat the fish. I know he would have shower mustard hidden in some compartment somewhere, though. Growing up in a small town really sucks because telling certain stories could backtrack and hurt businesses and, and whatever. Um, but, yeah, it was, it, it was the summer. I was working in a diner near where my dad lived in Middleton, and we had this uh, mouse problem. Just so you guys know, mice are everywhere. A lot of restaurants have them. They also don't wear gloves. Get over yourself. Cook yourself, then. One of those, one of those options. Anyway, we, we had a mouse. It got caught in the trap that we laid out for it. We were drying out bread to make croutons with later. Some of it went to uh, stuffing, but we're getting off the point. He looked at... I was like the number two in the kitchen... But, you know, minimum wage nonsense. He looked at the high schooler who was uh, bussing and doing the dishes, and he told him to take the mouse down to the basement, there's a bucket full with water, and drown that thing. And it was, it's one of the funniest moments I've ever been a part of because he, he didn't ask me to drown it, so it was hilarious. The young man that we'll, we'll just call Trevor... Probably won't need to say Trevor's name a whole lot. But the young man, instead of just holding it and feeling the life come out of this rat in his hands as he drowned it, just put it in the water, put the lid on the bucket, and honestly gave it a worse death. Mice get a bad rap for being carriers of disease, but, like, there are diseases. Who, who created them by accident? We did. It's not the mice's fault. 
They're just trying to eat our leftovers. Like tops. They're cute. They're smart. They live in a family. They're sentient. They have a soul. We should be cool to mice. The radioactive freshwater fish, on the other hand, were created by the devil to spite us and to really terrify me anytime I tried to walk around in the lake because no one taught me how to swim as a child. I still can't. Don't think I could ride a bike. I did it like once, basically, where I could prove I could keep my balance and go up and down the block. And that was it. I was done with the bike. You ever had a fish just like hit your Achilles? It's just the... W they're, they're so scary. I just can't. It, I'm hitting a wall with this. They scare me so much. You want to know what else is scary? Alligators. And we have now hit reason number three why reading right now. Kind of fucked up. Now, uh, the beautiful people at OutdoorLife.com did some journalism, which who knows what the fuck that means anymore. But this is why I'm terrified. Alligator dash catfish hybrids are being spawned in an Alabama lab. I really fucking hope there's as good of a reason as why they're going to try to bring mammoths back and put them up in the Arctic Circle so they push down on the fucking snow and ice, isolates it, and then the planet cools down just a little. Or it slows it down a little bit anyway. What could these alligator catfish hybrids do that would have a positive impact on society? Would eating all the forever chemical fish help? They seem like they'd be pretty good suited for that. Catfish eat fish shit anyway, so maybe the radioactiveness isn't gonna... Ugh, we're still without fish, though, so that's not great. It's not a great plan. Oh, yeah, I hate the start to this. In an effort to build a better catfish... Are you fucking kidding me with that? Researchers at Auburn University have genetically engineered a hybrid catfish species... Here's an alligator DNA. Thank you, Carrot. The methodology might sound scary. It fucking does. But the byproducts are nearly identical to the farm-raised catfish sold in grocery stores throughout the country. Regulatory approval isn't a guarantee, and these reptilian mud kitties... Pretty good line. Won't end up on the shelves anytime soon. We're supposed to eat these?! Alright, Americans eat a lot of catfish. Fucking southerners. It's impossible to put a number on how many chuckleheads we catch and cook on an annual basis. Regardless, it's not enough to satisfy the overall demand. We're really trying to eat that much catfish. In 2021, we imported around, the United States imported, 256 million pounds of it from other countries. Meanwhile, we commercially produce another 307 million pounds here. Why are we adding alligator DNA to these? Okay. The only problem with raising catfish in farm ponds is that these water bodies turn into breeding grounds for disease. Farmers lose a huge number of fish every year to various infections. Treat your water, dumbasses. That's why researchers at Auburn University were trying to create a more resilient catfish. There are some fucking gator DNA in there, and it'll live through the syphilis. We're gonna skip the how they made the sausage part of this, because we won't understand it anyway. It's some CRISPR technology. There, you got the acronym. We're gonna skip to the ethical concern section, because, yeah, one fear that came up during the experiment was the risk of genetically modified superfish escaping from farms and then disrupting the neighboring ecosystems. What if these things eat everything? To prevent this, they use the CRISPR gene editing tool, good acronym that we don't know anything about, to remove a catfish gene associated with reproduction. They replaced it with the alligator gene. With the gene swapped, the hybrid catfish are unable to reproduce. Nice little eugenics exercise for everybody. Part of me does believe in it. My parents shouldn't have kids. Your parents shouldn't have had kids together. At least, anyway, right? I have a genetic nerve disease that I can pass along. Maybe someone should come around and make sure that doesn't happen. In a just society, right? But we're just gonna leave it to nature, I guess. And I'll probably pass it on someday. Who 
Who knows? Oh, ethical concerns. Follow-up experiments proved that the survival rates of these hybrid fish were between two and five times higher. While they haven't been peer-reviewed yet, they have been published, so that's, that's science, baby. Because of the ethical concerns surrounding CRISPR technology and genetic modification, regulatory approval for these hybrid fish is an uncertainty because of society, right? Costanza line. Some have even argued that even if these hybrids are more resilient, most fish farmers don't have a use for lab spawn sterile fish. And even though the hybrid species is still a catfish, there's also the marketing problem of selling a hybridized alligator catfish to consumers. The chicken tasting fish? Based on college game day for 20 years of my life? Side note, I bet Mertz fucking kills it for them next year, just because. Dunham and Sue, who I presume are the scientists in charge of this nonsense, think people could eventually come around on the idea, and Dunham explained that it's unlikely anybody would notice difference in the meat itself. He would eat it in a heartbeat. Oh, did Mr. God Complex want to eat his creation? What a surprise. Our species does not discover things and not use them. Expect the alligator catfish to be living in a creek near you. It's a couple, yeah, sprung some legs or something, now it's eating your little cat. Beautiful. Humanity. On a happier note, I have been a Sacramento Kings fan since the 2002 Western Conference Finals, where... They got hosed by the refs, and Shaq and Kobe and Robert Horry Ori beat them in uh, seven games. The shitty thing about being a fan of something when you're like eight is you're a fan of that for the rest of your life. Same. It's just how, like, whatever you're attracted to during puberty, get fucking used to that shit. Same thing. So yeah, little me was a Kings fan because Mike Bibby was cool. And his skin color looked like mine a little bit, to be honest. Which, at the NBA level, is like the Barack Obama effect. Being a dope white point guard. Fuck Steve Nash, by the way. I was a Mike Bibby fan, not a Steve Nash fan. But yeah, white point guard? Don't grow on trees. Anyway, I fell in love with the fan base. They're the Hicks of California. That's fun, the cowbells thing. They have not made the playoffs since... Mike Bibby and Mike Miller led them to the playoffs in, like, 2004. I believe they lost in the first round to uh, Ray Allen and the Seattle Supersonics. So I guess you could say the Kings haven't made the playoffs since the Seattle Supersonics were a thing. Anyway, they're having a dope year. They're 29 and 21. I think soon to lose to the Pacers, 29-22. But what I really wanted to talk about the year of their resurrection, they started the season lighting a purple beam into the sky after every game they won. The irrational confidence that that takes to do when you haven't made the playoffs in 20 years is beautiful. It's art in itself, but what makes it, what I love so much about it, the first two nights that they did it, they didn't warn anyone that this was about to happen. 911 started getting phone calls from the airport, from the police department, fire department, fucking UFO people, saying, what the fuck is this beam? No one voted on it. No one chose to be the Pelicans here. The team just made a rare good decision and lit a beam 200 feet into the fucking sky. And after that initial confusion, Sacramento got the fuck on board. Anytime they're up like 15, one minute remaining in the first quarter, they just start chanting, Like that beam! Like that beam! So the Packers should buy those fucking in the same vein of like that beam. The Packers should buy like 18 snow machines and just anytime we win, preseason game to Super Bowl, we just drop like 18 inches on Green Bay. Guaranteed day off work for all Green Bay city limit livers. Livers. Visitors. No, not visitors. Well, you would have to get out of town pretty fucking quick. I love it, though. Let's do this. 18 inches, 10 times a year, Mike McCarthy level. We're in the playoffs. We might win a Super Bowl this year. 
That's our goal. Ten times we drop 18 inches on this city. Now, Jordan Love, don't you want to drop 180 inches of snow plus whatever winter brings on this great city this season? You better. That is the level of enthusiasm and tone I do think. Matt LaFleur. Mike LaFleur? I think that is his brother. Coach LaFleur uses with the player. It's just really like, hmm, you know, I don't know. Someone should, like, pick up that cup or something. We're not trying to leave a mess at the end of this meeting. Yes, it's not, like, that smart to call a timeout and give the ball back to Tom Brady in an NFC Championship game. I was kind of fucking asking to lose that game, but... Guys, can we please... Please pick up after ourselves. Does anyone in this room even give the janitors the time of day? Do you ever ask the janitor how they're doing? Amari! Amari Rogers! Look at me! Do you ever ask the janitor how he's doing? No? Then you're fucking cut. That's the reason you're cut, Amari. That's the reason. I could handle two muffed kickoffs every game. What I cannot handle is being rude to Judy. And honestly, I think that's a pretty accurate, like, description of the vibe of the Packers organization. And that is kind of why I love them. Nah! Keep fumbling, Amon Green. You'll figure it out. We believe in you. I don't know. Try John Madden's thing. He was a good coach. Try it. Yeah, the sleeves are causing you to fumble. That's just science. John Madden is a scientist before all else. And if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the drawing board. Maybe we should put that, like, receiver gloves just all the way up your arms and legs. Just pin it to your knee. Worst case scenario. But. We are scheduled to visit the elementary school this week, and if you aren't there, we're gonna hit you in the face with a baseball bat, okay? We didn't rush Dorsey Levins into the middle school to the point that he hit his head for you not to show up ten years later in my green. Now give me a hug before you go home for the night. Thanks, buddy. Sorry, I don't want to talk so rough and tough with you for sure, bud. It's just, the elementary kids look up to you, so... It's the least we can do. All right, everybody, remember to take your playbook with you when you leave the room. Not only are they confidential, but they're also about three trees total, so we got to respect them, and uh, I'll see y'all on Tuesday. And Reed Mueller, and no excuses, just reasons, we'll see you in like a week or something. Have a good one.